So hello, dear friends. I am very grateful to receive the opportunity to be invited by the Theosophical Society of America to address you on the topic of the laws of higher life. And the subtitle was given tips for a life of service. And before I do that, it might be a good idea to very briefly present myself. My name is Sabine, Sabine Van Osta, and I am an active member uh, of the Belgian Theosophical Society. And since that is the case, it seemed like an okay thing to show you a few pictures of the headquarters of the Belgian Theosophical Society in Brussels, so that you know where I am at this moment. And if ever people would love to come and visit us, we will very gladly receive you. And it is typically the thing to do, a theosophical thing to do, underlining the links of brotherhood among all theosophists and actually among all humanity. We probably get into this further on as we progress to visit one another and to share ideas and bits and pieces of wisdom wherever we find them in our individual lives. And so with that very brief introduction, I would to actually like to dive into the subject of today, the loss of higher life. And we first need to clarify where the material actually comes from. I actually inspired, highly inspired, and will quote intensively from a series of lectures given by Annie Besant in 1902. She was at that moment in Paris, and she gave three lectures on the loss of the higher life. I guess many people know about Annie Besant, about the importance she had and for the Theosophical Society, but also for things like the independence of India. She had a serious role to play there. She was, of course, a social activist. She was very vibrant in a number of activities of a social reforming order. I will not continue to elaborate on that, but of course, there is a very interesting book written by Muriel pécastin boissière on the life and the social activism and also the theosophical activity of Annie Besant. It's a book that I can very heartily recommend to read. This book, The Loss of the Higher Life, it is still in print. You can read it, of course, and as I often do, I would rather advise to read it in a meditative way, not too much intellectualizing, not too much on a mental, in a mental way, but rather to ponder upon the things she said. And actually, that's what I intend to do in the coming uh, minutes. So the loss of higher life, which contains actually three main topics on basis of three lectures that she gave. And we have, first of all, the larger consciousness, where she will elaborate on the law of nature. Uh, she will probably also discuss, on, for instance, things like how reality, as we theosophists consider it, how it is built up, the different planes of existence, the different grades of materiality, the different grades of subtlety in matter going from the gross physical matter to the very refined atmic matter. That is a theosophical technicality I'd rather not end up in, but know that there are different planes of existence the way that theosophy proposes and also 
we could find a like division in, uh, for instance, yogic science. Then she goes on with the law of duty. We will talk a bit on that, of course, on basis of some quotes. And then lastly, she will deal with the law of sacrifice. And when we come to that, I thought it useful to have some other work, some other small booklet of hers, and to um, take a few ideas from that, which is the doctrine of the heart, which I think is also a very important very small booklet of Annie Besson. And so with that, I wanted to uh, dive in, into the subject. We see, of course, a few times this word law, law of nature, law of duty, law of sacrifice. So obviously, this notion of law is quite important in the whole series of lectures, and we will see that. We will see its importance. We should understand that Annie Besant, she was, of course, a very good student also in the ancient wisdom of the East. So she was a very good student of the East, and she had read all the Eastern wisdom classics of those days and before. So this means that she was very well versed in texts like, for instance, the Bhagavad Gita. But she also knew about texts like the Vedas. And when it comes to the Vedas, the notion of law, meaning the notion of order, was a very important thing. And when we say order, we say also harmony. We play with the idea of having a totality in which every element has its specific place and its specific duty, has its specific role to play. And this is an important underlying idea to understand the, the topics that Annie Besant will start to develop. Because she will start, of course, describing the larger consciousness and the law of nature. And this is one way in which she, she deals with that. She says at a certain moment, after some introductory remarks, such she says, is the law of nature, a statement of conditions, of invariable sequences, of inviolable, unbreakable happenings. Such is the law. Thus must you think of it when you come to deal with the higher as with the lower life which is a very interesting way of putting things because here we see like this law, it is applicable to every level of existence, be it the higher or the lower life. The law is active everywhere at every moment. And on top of that, she says, it is an invariable sequence not even one, but many. And it has to do with unbreakable happiness. It sounds like quite a fixed thing here. We should keep that in mind as we progress. Because you could, of course, say, hmm, that is sounding like a bit like determinism of some kind. Everything seems to be fixed, which is not the case. But there is an awkward paradox going on here, and it will compel us to also sharpen our own discernment and our own intuition. Let's recall the recommendation of Helena Blavatsky you know, when she tries to explain how we best read her opus magnum, The Secret Doctrine. And when she says that 
we need not only to read it intellectually, but more importantly, with the heart, with our intuition. And it seems like you know, a good thing to do when we are dealing with uh, this text of Annie Besant as well. So she continues saying, know the law, obey it, work with it, and it lifts you up with its infinite strength, and it carries you to the goal that you desire to reach. The law, which is a danger when not known, becomes a savior when known and understood. So again, we are heavily invited to sharpen our discernment and to go beyond what we already know in certain ways. We have to, because we read it here, it is a danger when that law is not known. When we don't see the extent of that law, it could become a danger to us. Why? Because of certain effects that it might have and that we are rather unhappy with. So we want to avoid those. And so she continues. So with all other forces above and below, so in every field of the universe, visible and invisible, you must know the laws of the higher life if you would live it. Know them, meaning know those laws, and they will carry you onward to your goal. Be ignorant of them, and your efforts will be frustrated, and all your endeavors will be as though they had not been. So we here get the reason why we should know about those laws. And in fact, what she explains further is a specific play between two sets of laws, the laws of nature and the laws of higher life. And she says in a certain way that the one is a bit counteracting on the other, so to speak. So we need to deal with them. We will probably come back to that aspect in a, in a moment. All other forces above and below so all those forces which are indeed responding to law as a general notion. Larger consciousness. At some point, Annie Besson starts to explain that if you want to get to know the laws of higher life, we need to come to some sort of purification, which is quite important if we engage in that. And it is a typical purification, which we could, for instance, uh, see described in Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Another important theosophical author, Timney has indeed also uh, analyzed these different methods of purification of either our physical body, our emotional body, or our emotional life, and our mental life. And that same notion of purification, Annie Besant will also present it to uh, her audience. And she says it in this language, having controlled and purified the body, we can make it sensitive to the higher vibrations, responsive to the sounding of the sublimer notes. But to do this, we must lose our interest in the lower and become indifferent to the attractions of the outer life. Vairagya this passion we must have 
for that is a condition of the higher consciousness revealing itself in the lower world. While you love the lower things of the world, the higher consciousness cannot use this upadi as its vehicle. And with those two Sanskrit terms in this uh, quote, Vairagya is exactly dispassion, and upadi is a Sanskrit word for vehicle. There are many interesting ideas brought forward just in this quote alone, but I would like to linger a bit more on what she says to lose interest in the lower and to become indifferent to the attractions of outer life. It is typically what we would find again in the signs of yoga as a term called pratyahara, which means the withdrawal of the senses. So one of the ways to understand this part of the quote, to lose our interest in the lower and to become indifferent to the attractions of the outer life has to do with pratyahara. And probably it goes even more than just not use our senses and withdraw completely in ourselves as it is described in, for instance, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. But it also has to do with the other finer layers in human constitution, being the emotional and even the mental. So it also has to do with laying still and come to a complete standstill in our human constitution. Up to that point that we are at that moment not interested anymore in anything that surrounds us or that is going on in us, but that we wish to arrive to that entire point of stillness, which is necessary if we want to get in touch with the loss of higher life and if we want to start to have an inkling, to have an intuitive understanding of them. Just as well as this mechanism, this technique, if you like, is described in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, you will encounter the same principle in a lot of mystical writings. And we know the great names of mysticism, but please know that there are a great many more mystics around the world up to today there are still mystics living as we speak, but from some we have very interesting writings and it is indeed a very useful exercise to, for instance, start a comparative study uh, between the writings of Teresa of Avila with the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, just to name an example, or to take let's say, a text like the Bhagavad Gita. I will just take an example with the revelations of divine law by Julian of Norwich, just to give an idea on what direction a personal study could go. The larger consciousness, as Annie Besant continues to present it to us, she says, one pointed devotion to the Supreme, a clear, well balanced, intelligent development of the intellect and emotions. This is the road along which we must tread if the higher consciousness is to be manifested on earth. So it is not only for one individual, but actually, she says, it is the way forward for each individual, for every living soul. And she continues, we must be pure in life, compassionate and tender. 
We must learn to see the self, capital S, in everyone around us, in the ugly as well as in the beautiful, in the low as well as in the high, in the planet as well as in the deva. It is very good to also keep this one in mind because we will encounter it again as we progress through the texts. Obviously, a pure life, for those who are familiar with the Golden Stairs, is a very well-known notion. Of course, the way to be compassionate and tender, we might recall it from Buddhism, but we might just as well uh, recall it from Christianity, you can find it ultimately in every religious tradition that would respect itself and its profound basis of wisdom. Learning to see the self, capital S, in everyone around us. And of course, here the basic question is, what is that self? That's the paramount question, isn't it? We could find very beautiful descriptions of that. For instance, in the Bhagavad Gita, like I said, Annie Besant was a very good student of ancient wisdom, more importantly in the Bhagavad Gita. So she must have come across that term, the self and its beautiful descriptions by Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. And there we also see the self being described as the the supreme spirit, so to say, or another term for it, the eternal, the indescribable. Learning to see the self in everyone around us. And there must be a way to get there. What is that way? It brings us actually to the next stage that Annie Besant is describing to us. The next topic, the next lecture of her, which is about the law of duty. And as we already saw, the way in which she explains a notion like law, like something rather fixed, not something to fool around with, uh, no light matter indeed. Of course, we take into account the fact that she used the language of her day and the images which she could use in that particular time of history. Probably we would say things a bit differently now because they maybe sound a bit harsh to us. But anyway... The bottom line of her message is quite clear and, well, in my humble opinion, it is still very valid. So that's obviously the reason why I give it to you. She will start when explaining about the law of duty. She will make a clear description of what it is to be spiritual or what is spiritual. And she explains, the spiritual and the eternal is not of the life of form. Previously, she explained about the law of nature, which had a lot to do with the life of form. As we want to deal with the spiritual and the eternal, one of the first things she says is, it is not of the life of form. And she continues by saying, it is alone the life of the consciousness which recognizes unity, which sees oneself in everything and everything in the self. The spiritual life is the life which 
looking into the infinite number of phenomena, pierces through the veil of Maya and sees the one and the eternal within each changing form. To know the self, to love the self, to realize the self. That and that alone is spirituality. Even as to see the self everywhere alone is wisdom. All outside that is ignorance. All outside that is unspiritual. Now that is some clear language. The life of the consciousness which recognizes unity. And again, we might feel in this term of unity, indeed, that aspect of law and that aspect of order. And at the same time, seeing oneself in everything and everything in the self. That is what spiritual life is all about. And so, again, we feel the balancing act between two forces which are constantly at work in our lives, in the lives of everybody, and probably even if we try to extend our vision a bit further, two forces which are at play constantly in the entire universe. And she has a specific, before we get back to this text, she has a specific way of describing that balancing act by saying, the other powers, meaning the powers of nature, the powers of form, so to say, the other powers are our friends. And in so far as we resist them and oppose them, and they can only help us when we strive against them, for then they strengthen the spiritual muscles and nerves. But the success that we can gain in their region in evolution lies in the power by which we combat them. And the strength that is evolved in the struggle helps forward our evolution. Again, very strong language. Do we wish to lead the spiritual life? Do we really want to be of service? Then there are certain powers in the manifestation which we do not need to bluntly follow but which we need to resist and at sometimes even oppose them. And these are exactly the powers of form and the powers of matter. Again, we find the same idea in yogic tradition and in the mystical tradition. We are constantly dealing with this, yogis and mystics alike. To go beyond matter, to leave matter for what it is, and to have indeed, as we previously read, that one-pointed attention for the one. That one-pointed attention for the spiritual. And to gear our point of consciousness entirely to the higher realms, away from this plane of manifestation. It is quite a thing to do, as it is already quite a thing to play with the idea alone and to be informed, as theosophy does it, as all the great spiritual traditions do, to gear our attention and to actually give techniques to give a methodology, to give a pathway for doing so in a secure environment and in a secure way, in a way that we do not damage anything of our constitution, 
but to go towards it as harmoniously as we can possibly do. And so she continues on the other powers. They are not to be followed, not to be obeyed, not to be meditated upon, nor appealed to. And then, of course, how then shall the wayfarer choose his path and know the test whereby one may be distinguished from the other? And indeed, that is the big question. How can we discern when one power is at play and when do we discern another? Because in the end, the other powers who are our friends in as far as we resist and oppose them, or at least not go with them and follow them bluntly, those other powers are not only at play in the physical realm, but in all the realms of manifestation. In contrast with actual spiritual realities and spiritual powers. And so therefore, if we return to the previous, that's when she says, that is the note of the spirit. All is in the self and the one is recognized everywhere. And the unity is recognized everywhere. Throughout the infinite number of phenomena, we just see that one unique thing through the veil of Maya. It's a very interesting thought indeed. But what with the law of duty? The role of that law of duty is the following. The first great step towards the attainment of this realization of the self is the law of duty. So it is, so to say, our first tool in going, in threading that path towards the unity and towards knowing the self, loving the self, realizing the self. By the law of duty within him, by the divine self which points out the path of progress, by obedience to duty above all else, and by reverencing truth as greatest and worshipping it without a shadow of wavering or an idea of change. Again, very strong language of Annie Besant. There cannot be much doubt as to where she wants to go Obedience to duty, recognizing your duty, of course, but then also just doing it, that's the first stepping to stone towards knowing the self, capital S. Without a shadow of wavering or an idea of change, for those who have read the Bhagavad Gita, they might recall one of the well-known scenes on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Arjuna is preparing himself, conversing with Lord Krishna, and Lord Krishna gives him the choice, either choosing himself a very vast army with all the warriors and what comes with it to enter into the battle, or just confront the other party with just Lord Krishna as his assistant, which is, of course, an ultimate test of some kind. By whom do you wish to be helped? Me, the teacher, the master, or an entire army, the army symbolizing, in fact, everything that manifestation has to offer. So essentially and symbolically, the choice that Arjuna is given is the one between the manifestation 
the lower worlds or the spiritual worlds, worlds, the higher life. And we all know what the choice is of Arjuna, and it is an unwavering choice. It is a very determined choice. Arjuna does not doubt. He does not even need to think about it. There is no shadow of doubt whatsoever. He chooses the master. He chooses wisdom. He chooses the path of self-realization. This is the kind of determination that we are talking about here. And that was probably also what Annie Besant had in mind. So she continues, so that when we are studying the law of duty, we must begin by studying our own place on the great ladder of evolution, by studying the circumstances around us that show our karma, by studying our own powers and capacities and ascertaining our weaknesses. That was the choice of Arjuna. He also knew his own weakness, but he knew that with the assistance of his teacher, he would be able to overcome any difficulty which might lay ahead. And out of this careful study, we must find out the law of duty by which we must guide our steps. In other words, that's the way to find our, our individual dharma, the purpose of our life. Very beautiful and very profound wisdom indeed. One might say, well, okay, um, showing our own karma, trying to find our own dharma. Uh, and if you have found it, you can indeed tread on the path towards self-realization, towards knowing and realizing and loving the self. What if it takes me a while? Would there be a circumstance where I would say, mm, I am a bit lost here and there are different positions taken in by different people, also by different teachers. Some say, no, you can't go astray. Of course not. You're never lost. Others say, like, mm, you better be careful because you could turn around in circles. I'm not here to actually take an opinion in that, but know that there are different positions to take and it is actually up to each one of us to find it out for ourselves and to see to what position, to what approach we are most attracted to. This, All of this in uh, the framework of the law of duty. So next, Annie Besson starts explaining about the law of sacrifice. She first goes about explaining the different types of sacrifice as they can be found in ancient wisdom. Sacrifices sometimes of a quite a material kind, the thing that we would offering flowers, offering incense, other kind of offerings. But of course, there is more to sacrifice than just that. And it is very easily because sacrifice is, again, a very profound notion indeed. So we need to analyze a bit more with the heart, so to say, and with our intuition. And I would first like to have a quote from exactly the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3, where it says, you have learned to do some acts as acts of obligation. We understand here, we could just as well say duty. You now have to learn 
Yeah, the world is bound by action, safe by such action as is sacrifice. You must learn that looking for the fruit of actions binds us to the world of actions. And that if we would be free from such binding, we must learn to sacrifice everywhere the fruit of action. Now, we could say, now wait a minute. We just had a whole presentation on the law of duty. We should do our duty. We should recognize our duty. And then we just should do it in order to come to self-realization, to know the self, to love the self, etc. And now we say that actually we should not look for the fruit of action. Now, what is this? Because finally, every action that we do, it binds us to this world, to the world of action. It binds us to the action itself, except when that action is meant as a sacrifice. Very interesting thought indeed. And luckily, Annie Besant goes so deeper into that. Man then, meaning the human being, cannot even live in the world of forms safe as he performs acts of sacrifice. The revolving wheel of life cannot go on unless each member, unless each living creature helps to turn it by the performance of acts of sacrifice. She puts it even stronger. Life is preserved by sacrifice. And in sacrifice, all evolution is rooted. This is really something to be meditated on very deeply. It says it all. I would say even nearly useful to start explaining it because it would be it would be um, not such a good thing to really try to delve it all out mentally. It is something again inviting us to sharpen intuition and discernment. But indeed, if that would be the case, just try to think of it, try to meditate. What would that mean also for my life, for life in general on this planet? I mean, despite everything that is going on, it is still there. Cycles are still running. In some regions of the world, uh, there are no such thing as seasons in the way that in other, certain other parts of the world, there are seasons. What is behind all that? And then we read something like, life is preserved by sacrifice. And we can have an inkling on what this term life is stands for. It is a very broad term. So what sacrifices are being made for life to be preserved? That's the whole point. In fact, one of the sacrifices that we all make whether we are conscious of it or not, is the fact that we feel ourselves rather alone and cut off from the unity and the totality of manifestation, the larger part of our lives. That's the whole point of a personality. That's the whole point of being able to say, I and me is to have lost that connection with the all. It is the fact of being cut off of our origin. And might that not be, it's just I want to 
put it forward rather as a question than an actual axioma, might it not be possible that that is a sacrifice that we all have made? There are some beautiful renderings on that origin of mankind. And to have also a bit of a balancing act between East and West, there is this very beautiful psalm, Psalm 139, which was recently uh, sung in a very beautiful way on the occasion of uh, the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II, so it was not that long ago, in a very beautiful version, which is very hard to find. It's only to be found on YouTube, particularly at the moment where they bear the coffin into Westminster Hall for it to be lying in state, so to say, and then this psalm is sung. It's a very beautiful, I can recommend it to everybody. And it is exactly talking about the origin of the individual and its relationship to that origin. And I allow myself to quote a few verses of that. And it is verses 13 to 17. And it says... For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know them full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. And this indeed is a very beautiful rendering also of what we learn in theosophy when we describe the way an incarnation is being prepared by the lords of karma and that they combine some sort of life program for the individual to incarnate and, well, we just see it here in the psalm, very well written. But then we say, without sacrifice, we were busy telling that, without sacrifice, we cannot live in the world of forms. Indeed, without sacrifice, we cannot live in that world, but we cannot get out of the world either. The life forms serves ultimately and exactly to the purpose of getting out of it, out of manifestation. It's our starting point to thread the path. It's sort of, it's a sort of tool to actually go towards self-realization. And it's also a tool in a certain way, even if at some point we need really to leave it behind towards our origin. Again, I wish to already start quoting from the doctrine of the heart, where Annie Besson said, the world is bound by karma, by action, save that action, which is sacrifice. And again, this huge role of sacrifice the whole plan of trying to realize oneself and one's divine origin. And to continue with the doctrine of the heart, a very small booklet by Annie Besant, and 
the reason why I wish to bring it under the attention be- is because it even gives a few more interesting elements into the whole theme of sacrifice. Again, a very strong message which helps us to see to what extent it needs to bring us towards our way of loving and realizing the self and more particularly the approach that we need in that. I explain myself in the words of Annie Besant. When it comes to service, she says, and service is often taken as a form of sacrifice, you can either start or choose to help someone else and to perform service or to choose for yourself and choose for your own enjoyment. We are talking here clearly about service, choosing to be of service to someone else. And then she says, to serve for the sake of service and not for the pleasure we take in serving is to make a distinct step forward for we then begin to gain that balance, that equilibrium, which enables us to serve as contentedly in failure as in success, in inner darkness as in inner light. We already read that we should not take too much or attach too much importance to the fruit of performing our duty, the fruit of action. And here it is even put more clearly because one of the things that could happen is that we would be of service just to feel good. To think, ha, ah, I did a good thing. I did a good deed. No. You just serve for the sake of service because it is the only thing to do. There is no other option. You even forget about the pleasure or the contentment when you have done something. And when we arrive in an honest way to be of service, in that mindset, in that heart, then we make that distinct step forward. Then things will tip over into the direction of the higher life. Only be always firm in faith and devotion and swerve not from the sacred path of love and truth. This is your part. So it is clear, that's what we are supposed to be doing. Not swerving from the sacred path, not swerving from the path altogether. And the rest shall be done for you by the merciful Lord's use of And then she goes on saying, you know all this. And if I speak of it, it is only to strengthen you in your knowledge. For we often forget some of our best lessons. And in times of trouble, the duty of a friend is more to remind you of your own sayings than to inculcate new truths. And of course, deep down in our hearts, This wisdom is always there. And it is indeed a very useful thing to be recalled of it. A new element here, of course, in the doctrine of the heart, which is popping up, is the merciful lords. And she has some very interesting things to say about these merciful laws, because As we see things proposed here, set out here, we only need to do a tiny thing. That's one of the ongoing discussions in different traditions. What is our effort 
do we need to do the effort and it will just be the effort that makes that we will be self-realized or is there still something else needed in order to actually reach that goal? It's a continuous discussion going on throughout the school, throughout the ages. In this particular case, the doctrine of the heart, which is sort of presentation of what we call bhakti yoga. In this particular case, the merciful lords, the great ones, always come in play. And in fact, it is what I said previously about Arjuna and Lord Krishna, the disciple and the master, the disciple having an unwavering trust into the reality and the support of the master. And we find again a very interesting expression of that trust, specifically in the doctrine of the heart, when she says, Annie Besson, they, meaning the merciful lords, the great ones, the masters, whichever master we choose, they will never desert us. And that is as certain as death. And we know death as being a quite firm and certain thing. And she continues, it is for us to cling to them with real and deep devotion. If our devotion be real and deep, there is not the remotest chance of our falling away from their holy feet. Let's remind ourselves that devotion, real and deep devotion, it is something that starts on the emotional plane, but it needs to be real, it needs to be deep, and above all, it needs to be pure meaning devoid of anything self-seeking, self-confirming. That's the kind of devotion and that's the type of emotion that we are dealing with here. And if we can indeed surf, so to say, on that pure emotion, we will always be assured of the assistance of the great ones. Whatever master it is that we choose. And she continues, you know what real and deep devotion means. You know just as well as I do that nothing short of complete renunciation of the personal will, the absolute annihilation of the personal element in man can constitute bhakti proper and genuine. And so with this, we are actually in the middle of the higher life and the mechanics that leads us toward realizing the higher life. We are here in the midst of the laws of higher life, the complete renunciation of the personal will. And obviously, if you would consider that from the point of view of a personality, then all the alarm bells are clinging at the same time, because that is something that will come to an end if we thread and if we dive, so to say, into that spiritual realm. Again, it is a reality, it is a mechanics that can be found very easily in mystic writings of all ages up till today. And to put it in their language, they would say something like, to die unto oneself. That would be the typical, one of the typical um, expressions to give the same reality, to die unto ourselves, 
meaning towards our personality. And what is it then that we go towards? Well, then when we begin to live the life of spirit, the life which recognizes the one in the manifold forms, then there begins to dawn upon us the supreme spiritual truth that sacrifice is not pain, but joy, is not sorrow, but delight. That that which to the flesh is painful is bliss to the spirit, which is our true life. So that is where we actually belong. And so the sacrifice, which we first were afraid of, if we take the jump, if we take the leap into the spiritual fully, wholeheartedly, then we come to see that it's not painful, but it's actually a very joyful thing to do. Except that you need to leave everything behind which you have believed in before. And so then we see that the aspect of sacrifice that was sorrowful was actually another delusion, says Annie Besson, that keener than any pleasure that the world can give, more joyous than any joy that comes from wealth or position, more blissful than any bliss that the world can offer, is the bliss of the free spirit which by pouring itself out, finds the union with the self and knows that it is living in many forms, flowing along many channels, instead of following the limitation of a single form. And this one comes again from the loss of higher life. It is a very profound verity and also a testified one, as Joy Mills once said, I have this. She said, theosophy is actually a number of testified verities, which have been testified by many yogis and mystics alike. Pouring ourselves out, that is what we are invited to do and to recognize that oneness throughout all the different forms of manifestations or to recognize the oneness throughout all the different traditions, to put it in a different way, but still it's saying the same thing over and over again. It is to tap into some kind of huge reservoir of love, of energy, call it what you want. And once you tap on that, there is actually no limitation to the service that you can actually give to this world. And again, there are many examples, many examples present and in ages past and in our present time. We just need to see one of the points is those who really do perform that kind of service, they are very difficult to find because they would typically not put their own efforts in the newspaper or on YouTube or whatever it is. So it might be that you need to dig a little bit deeper into some fact-finding and some sources to study before you come across these individuals, but they actually are, are still there. And so this, all of this is one of the reasons why we find, again, in the doctrine of the heart, this splendid 
sentence, which I call the love principle. Spiritual life and love are not exhausted by being spent. Obviously, because if it is all coming out of a genuine and a wholehearted service, you are indeed tapping into that limitless source of love and energy. So it is, in fact, a paramount principle. You would say, well, I have a lot of people. I have tried to help out a lot of people. And in the end, I was exhausted. I had a burnout, etc. If that is the case, and I am sometimes quite close to such a moment myself, but if that is the case, it just means that we should gear again our attention and our motivation to gear it more precisely onto what we called earlier the cell. It's just the fact that we are insufficiently connected with that one source. And then it is usually a question of indeed trying to come back to a point of restful stillness and try to find your way through in all the different challenges that are surrounding us, and which in themselves are still expressions of the one and same reality, inviting us indeed to readjust our motivation and our view on things. And with all of these explanations, I would actually conclude with what I find a very beautiful prayer, a very beautiful text from a one of the more well-known Christian mystics, namely Saint Francis of Assisi. And maybe some of you know it, maybe others don't, but I think it is a very fine way to conclude our presentation here, the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, who says, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon me. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it's in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And with it comes a painting by William Hunt, The Light of the World. And we can all clearly see what it actually represents. Christ trying to tap on the door of the heart. And we see there's quite some... Uh, plants growing over it, so it's a rather unused door, but still he continues to knock on that door so that we might open our heart. It's in dying that we are born to eternal life by everything that has preceded. It is my humble hope that you have find, again, a new avenue of meaning into also this very beautiful text, uh, just as well as I hope that you gained a few insights to again reread the mission statement of the Theosophical Society. Whenever I can, I want to uh, present it because I think it is a very important thing. Theosophical Society who wishes to serve humanity by cultivating an ever-deepening understanding and realization of the ageless wisdom. We have come across it now throughout the presentation. 
spiritual self-transformation. We have been talking about nothing else but that and the unity of life, of all life. And that too, we, we recognize. So in this way, I think at least this was a sort of theosophical presentation. And then to really conclude, just a few tips for further reading or rereading all very fine books, theosophical le literature that I can highly recommend and in which you will find all the concepts and the notions and some exercises that we have been talking about, either in a lengthy detail or in a very brief expression, but I can very heartily recommend that you read either one or two or all of them. And with that, I just wish to thank you for your attention and I wish you a very inspireful and inspiring continuation of your own theosophical journey.